actually find the poems that you um, want to read? Did you find them? I just found poem, uh, the poems I've never read. I just grabbed a group of them and I thought I'd try reading those. And some of the, some of the ones you've heard and some you haven't heard. And I thought I'd read a few of those. So, mm -hmm. Simply because they have copies. Have you been doing a lot of readings? No, a few. A few. Yeah. I, our last time I read it was in Provincetown. It was also with Jack on the Cape when he came back from Europe. Really? Yeah. That was really a nice reading. Well, it was nice. Well, you could bring up that. You read at the uh, MLA convention. Oh, right. I forgot about that. That was really wild. To the MLA convention? Yes. Yes. All those rooms with all those things happening? Yes. <laughs> It was a pretty, it was Hospitality pretty suites. Yeah. It was actually cultures. pretty neat. Yeah. Everybody being big time. That was yeah. sort of like yeah. a welcome home too, because when I read there, all my friends came. Yeah. Shocking. Yeah. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know who Paul Mariah? Yeah. Yeah, that's where I met Paul. It was at the, not the MLA, but at the National Council of Teachers. Who's Paul Mariah? He's a local poet. He's is he co-editor of Root, Man Root? Yeah. With yeah. um I don't know. Um, I can't remember. Young, very nice young boy. He worked with Duncan for a long time. He, was Duncan. he worked with Duncan for Duncan? Yeah. He was Duncan's, I guess, secretary for a while. Oh yeah? yeah. That's nice. And he's Maybe doing, that's uh, what I heard from him. He's doing Duncan's collected works now. And Michelin's oh. collected works, which is, I think is really so it's just in case. It's hipper, you know, to be in the back. Well, maybe it's just nasty. experience. <laughs> yeah. Do some business. They screw up the checks. I uh, went through this hassle with the, with the light. There's no no problem at all. As much as they're ready for you and them. Yeah. <laughs> there have been times, you know, where I've given. <laughs> I know. I mean, the fact is, you know, you, you do it. I mean, like, I write every day. I'm writing poetry every day. She really works. But it's only time. very, very um, rarely that I ever ask myself, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> really, you know, what is this all about? Yeah, she said, coming up in the car, she says, I suddenly realized, I was thinking about it, why do people listen to poems? Why would they want to? You ever that feeling? Or why would. Yeah. 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 I sort of know. That writing poetry is like a state of emergency. Then there's a little panic. Comes out of crisis. Yeah, you know. Linda always gets panicky before reading. So I kind of understand why things get written. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't understand why anybody wants to know about it. <laughs> I think when you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to suggest to them they move up closer so we don't have to yeah. project? Yeah. If they. Good. Uh. I made the cookies. Mm. I did. Yeah. Well, I'm going to introduce Jack. <laughs> <laughs> terrific. <laughs> or terrific, as it says in the Holy Grail. Let's see. <laughs> I feel like I'm attached to my heart, life-sustaining system. <laughs> Get up. <laughs> Hope you're going to be able to hear back there, can you? Yeah. I'm going to read first, and then I'll read for about a half an hour, and then hopefully we'll take a short break, and then Linda will read. And if anybody wants to stay and talk afterwards, we'd be happy to. I'm going to start by warning you a little about me. Uh, I think I probably write poetry differently than what you're used to hearing. It's, um, it's not like most of the assumptions about poetry in the Bay Area. I think most of the poetry here is poetry that shares with you a human experience in a way that you can respond to and that you understand. The poems usually bring about a reaction of something like, I felt that too, or I know what you mean, or um, that must have been tough.
It's the, those are like going to see um, American Graffiti or uh, The Last Picture Show. Marvel. Or they're like uh, films like um, Greta Garbo in uh, Camillo, which you go and you have, you know, marvelous emotional outpouring. Pouring. I think, in a way, my poetry is, is a little like, I don't mean in, that it's as good as, but it's like going to a film by maybe Imar Behrman. And the films are trying to tell you things that either you don't know or you don't want to know, or that you have to go home and um, work on. They're not directly available, I think, by and large. I'm not saying it's the way poetry should be. I'm saying that's the way I write. I'm going to talk about some of my poems because I think it's extremely difficult to hear poems that are not printed on a page. If you have a poem in front of you, you can read it twice or figure it out. And I conceive of, of a poetry reading as a kind of, um, when I go to a poetry reading, I'm not so much interested in just hearing poems. I come to see how the man drinks his water, or whether he, um, what kind of socks he has on. Um, I like to see him encountering his poetry. And I like to hear him talk because I like to see what he thinks he's doing. I was going to start with a poem which I don't see here. It, it goes, it's called Games. Imagine if suffering were real. Imagine if old people really were afraid of death. If, the, if sick mothers altered their children with knives. What if the girl with one arm or the midget really felt pain? What then? How impossible it would be to live if some people were alone and afraid all their lives. This poem is titled Elephant Hunt in Guadalajara. And of course, there are no elephants in Guadalajara. It is one of my central obsessions. Um, Last night in the class I was teaching, there was a girl who had just spent a year sailing on her, with somebody else on a, on a ship, through the South Pacific around the Marquesas and the uh, French Peloponnesus. Or the French, uh, not El Peloponnesus, anyhow, that, those French islands. And I was trying to explain to her why I would not want to spend time living there. She was going back to live there and she said it's beautiful, marvelous, lovely. And I said, I believe it, and I'd like to go for three months. And I told her about living in Bali for, th for a month, or Thailand for a month. And I was saying how lovely it was, and trying to explain why I would leave. I, could have, I was invited to teach in places, and I said, no, because it was not of use to me. And this poem is about the the reason why I would choose not to live there. And I hope it's... I live, with my, live alone with my poetry a lot, so I'm never sure whether it is communicable. This takes place in, in a very cheap, flesh nightclub in Guadalajara. Elephant hunt in Guadalajara. El Serape's floor show finished at one. The lights went off, and strong girls came like tin moths to dance carefully with us for eight cents. 
Now, at last, the old tenor has begun the de deadly three o'clock show with its granite Mexican music. The girls are asleep in the side booths. Where is it? Where in the name of Christ is it? Out on the balcony, naked and brilliant in the Athenian moonlight, I press to the shutter of the French girl in the next room at work on my Sistine Chapel. <laughs> what pleasure I have of me in dying, what pride drunk on the little time left, dying and bowing my thank yous to all. I look on the world and might topples all creation, might of the spirit, of the heart, might as a condition, a dream of immense foolishness, the dance of this old man in me. I recognize the sparrows fluttering in the dust of this spring day, astonished that they are having a bath in dirt. I center my frailness in the might of heaven and pivot the earth, dismissing the stars as merely marvelous bulk. Mightiness chords in me, forming all, shaping the street. I sing and know I sing, surpassing the Amazon and the birds to hell with vanity. It is too late for that, for one who has failed as cheaply as I have failed. I brag of what flexes in me, in my eye, in my love. I fashion the moment. I stand on my long, blundering life and feel the mightiness I have become. It is I who fabricate angels. I who pass the laws of flesh. I see the world. I sing so out into the emptiness. Fuck you, I sing. Fuck you, Mr. Death. This is the mightiness that watched the sparrows today. <clears throat> I was lying in the dark, <clears throat> testing how much snow there was inside of me after the recent happiness, when the ghost of the night bird appeared to me carrying a fan. As he danced, I realized he suffered in his own way, apart from his appearances representing sorrow. Does he know about how it leaks away then, I thought? Does he know that the bird he is will seep away more each decade now as he grows old? He held his two hands touching at the fingertips before his face which I know means profound grief. But then, after remaining still for a long time, he touched near his knee, meaning passion. He left me with that sentimental gesture of affirmation. This is titled Salah, Salah, Salah. The iron archangels are commanded, above all things, to say no, to praise the better, each one fierce, dancing softly in his Walden, singing and praising genius, going about, the, going about among the doctrine of the ordinary, crying out in their odd voices, great is man, great is man, it is most touching. I'll do it again. The iron archangels are commanded above all things to say no, to praise the better. Each one fierce, dancing softly in his Walden, singing and praising genius. Going about among the doctrine of the ordinary, crying out in their odd voices, great is man, great is man at his most, touching the old and the gentle poor and those who are alone with cherishing hands, 
but without yielding. Velvita. Even opening cans is too hard. So I eat cheese and old crackers, sit among unread newspapers, whimpering at the cramp not going away. The windows urge field and summer and that light under the maples by the barn. I think of people working the ratchet of love and how much I'd like to go back to mathematics. Why do they want a program like this? Me sitting on camera naked and dirty and eating the greasy cheese and holding my shoulders back. <laughs> Here's a similar poem. The famous American professor on the local bus watches the full moon rise over the Korean mountains, eating his shoestring potatoes and lemon drops. <laughs> <laughs> Dead snow, machinery, and garbage, and the vicious wind. I go squeezed together like a fist, thinking of all those breaking hearts, of lovers losing each other. It is a language I can't translate. I dream greedily of their pain. This is the same poem in a different form. Digging into the apple with my thumbnails, scraping out my clog nails and digging inside, refusing the moon color, refusing the smell and memories, digging in with the sweet juice running along my hands to my wrists unpleasantly, refusing the sweetness, turning my hand to gouge out chunks, refusing China, refusing the Japanese, feeling the juice get sticky, refusing the Georgians, feeling my skin itch, refusing the professors getting to the wooden part, refusing the adolescents getting to the seeds, going on, not talking, anybody, not talking, refusing loveliness, refusing ugliness, getting beyond the seeds. This is the poem was written in um, Japan when I listened to the World Series. It came on at four in the morning, very faintly and, and intermittently. The only person in Japan listening to the Pirates and Cincinnati Reds and the rest. Lying, this is just four lines. I'm in love with little poems. Lying in the dark, listening to the World Series at four in the morning, eating rice crackers and green tea, getting ready to be 50. I don't know if you know about um, Charles and Mary Lamb. They wrote the um, children's Shakespeare, I guess it's called. Uh, beautiful, beautiful people. He was an essayist of the early 19th century, I guess. And she was, they lived together because she, she had a nervous problem and so he never had children because he had to help take care of her. She would continually have nervous breakdowns, I mean, once in a while throughout her life. And she would know when she was going to go mad and she would come and tell him and they'd pack a little bag for her with her clothes and lunch and then they would walk to the madhouse together holding hands with tears running down their face. out into the Greek sun, which makes me forget why I am so happy. I reach the beach and stand looking out and out, recovering my local particularity. Look out, waning. I covetly touch my arm, and we go off like Lamb and his sister, tender and weeping, toward the hospital.
dark fires of that real hell are piled so thick out there, I can only see the motion of the trees. In love with the wife who left me, crazy about the world that's leaking away, holding myself tenderly in this marred body, not knowing whether the quiet I feel is the happiness they all talk about or part of the moderation that indicates decline. You get accustomed, it's called. I had the habit of being young, of being one of the candidates, of loving. I'm all right here, they tell me. I must be. If not, where could I be? Success. I decided to set a quota on the roaches, to kill at least 50 each day. <laughs> and for two weeks it went well. Often I would kill twice that number. When it got harder, I learned to know them, learned to creep, so could still kill the minimum. Now, a month after moving in here, I'm lying in the dark long after midnight, stuck at 48. <laughs> Now a month after moving in here, I'm lying in the dark, long after midnight, stuck at 48, tired and discontent. <laughs> I come home to this sun, S-O-N. I come home to this sun my body is, this earth which is my daughter, and this clean loneliness I make my wife. Dear family, we will play cards on rainy days and have sardine sandwiches in the middle of the night. There is no one who can control us since we live in this secret place under the ocean of the day. I walk with us at four in the morning and come back to read Anne Karenina while eating oranges and whatever candy I can find. When it rains, there are all the slow movements of the Mozart concertos. There are indecent pictures of magnificent beauties in the bedroom, newspapers in foolish heaps wet from the bathtub. My dears, I have no advice. Certainly there is no way to have the French-speaking angels. I admit it, and spring is for others. But what wonderful Septembers and what summer nights we talk of here, telling each other how it was there among the living. The boat named tomorrow has been pulled up on the empty beach. The cargo has been carried over the hill to the village. All the moonlight night long, it sings Monteverdi quietly along the smooth sand. <laughs> Where the marble spirit flies, there do I reside. No, where the marble spirit flies, there do I reside. The flesh of stone is sweet, where fruit and virtue meet. The moon's whole paradigm, both day and night, are mine. The bird that is the mind, finally, is kind. This is a diatribe against Dionysius. I guess I'm the only person left who dislikes Dionysus. <laughs> and I really don't understand it. You know, Dionysus never loved anything. Dionysus is a hater, a destroyer. Unless you think that, you know, somebody who's drunk in bed is sexy. <laughs> All this history is, you know, to confuse that with, with real vitality, real energy. That's like thinking somebody on acid is a good talker. <laughs> and I'm really angry that they think now that Apollo is the pale professor of uh, 
Intermediate Wisdom 103, <laughs> and who always takes the garbage out and is loyal to his wife and um, is very convenient. And the details about Apollo in this poem are the details from early Homer, as this is what Apollo really was before Nietzsche turned him into a domesticated fink. <laughs> This is called Translation into the Original, and it has a word that may offend somebody in it. But we have no better word. It's not medical. <laughs> Translation into the Original. Apollo walks the deep roads back in the hills through the sleet to the warm place she is eats her fine cunt, and after they pretend to watch the late movie to cover the happiness. He swims with his body in the empty Tyrrhenian sea, comes out of that blue with his exigent mind, cherishes and makes all winter in Manhattan. But Apollo is not reasonable about desire. This wolf god, rest god, Lord of the countryside, God of dance, and lover of mortal women. Homer said he is fierce, his coming like the swift coming of night, that the gods feel fear and awe in his presence, this lawgiver, explainer of the rules of death, above all, averter of evil and praiser of the best. The violent indifference of Dionysus makes nothing live. Apollo stands in the brilliant fields watching the wind change the olive trees. He comes back through the dark singing so quietly you can hear nothing. <coughs> this is the kind of stuff that's being read to you. This was written last week. As slowly as possible, I said, and we went into paradise. Rushes alternate with floating islands of tomatoes. There's rushes, uh, reeds, uh, seagrass. It's, um, this takes place in, in, in Kashmir, up in the Vale among the Himalayan mountains. As slowly as possible, I said, and we went into paradise. Rushes alternate with floating islands of tomatoes. Stretches of lily pads and then lotus. The kingfishers flashed blue and went under the water, making a sound in the silence. After, I could hear her breath. I lie beside her. No. As slowly as possible, I said, and we went into paradise, rushes alternate with floating islands of tomatoes. Stretches of lily pads and then lotus. The kingfishers flashed blue and went under the water, making a sound in the silence. After, I could hear her breath. I lie in this fine smell of water, remembering the gardens of the Chinese built a thousand years ago as a picture of the pure land, because the people could not imagine any way to live that wasn't pain. I think of the others working on paradise, of my friend who lives on the Delaware and fashions heaven out of the burned buildings which were the delicatessens and automats of his youth in New York. One of my friends designs a paradise out of fairness for everyone. I know a woman who makes it out of her body. I lie here trying to figure out what the uncomfortable model is that I have carpentered together out of these 25 years. Get those barrels off, he said, and we rolled away the hogsheads. Get the doors open. We finally managed to raise the great doors. The ladders are far too short, she said. Get a line down in there. 
And as they did, I was thinking how typical it was that I was the only one in the cellar with his clothes on. Mind your line, get a hitch around there, he ordered. Almost immediately, the rope snapped taut and began squeaking from the immense weight. Who was it climbing out? That's what had brought me here, not the pedophilia, not the music. Which one was down there? Which role would be left for me? This is one of the poems I like best of my poems. <coughs> it was written in, in Denmark a few years ago. I was walking in the, the garden of the, um, the castle of the king, the former king, and in the winter and snowing. This was after I left America and left San Francisco and left the revolution and left what was happening. Left Dionysus, left letting it all hang out, left, um, you know, the drug mystique and the rest. A description of happiness in Copenhagen. All this windless day, snow fell into the king's garden where I walked perfecting and growing old, abandoning one by one everybody, randomly in love with the paradise furnace of my mind. Now I sit in the dark dreaming of a marble sun and its strictness. This is to tell you I am not coming back, to tell you instead of my private life among people who must wrestle their hearts to feel anything as though it were unnatural. What I master by day still lapses in the night, but I go on with the cargo cult, blindly feeling the snow come down, learning to flower by tightening. This is called pewter. And it's called pewter because pewter is um, one of the few substances that expands as it gets cold. And when I've read this before, I've said, that's my dream of growing up. Pewter. Thrushes flying under the lake. Nightingale singing underground. Yes, my king. Paris hungry and leisurely just after the war. Yes. America falling into history. Yes. Those silent winter afternoons along the Seine when I was always alone. Yes, my king. Rain everywhere in the forests of Pennsylvania as the king's coach lumbered and was caught and all stood gathered close as the black trees went on and on. Ah, my king, it was the sweet time of our lives, the rain shining on their faces, the loud sound of rain around. Like the nights we waited, knowing our girl was warm and moaning under another. My cold mansard looked out over the huge hospital of the poor and far down on Paris, gray and beautiful under the February rain. Between that and this. That yes and this yes. Between my king, that forgotten pain and this consequence. Those lovely long ago night bells which I did not notice now grow more and more apparent in me like pewter expanding as it cools, yes, like a king halted in the great forest of Pennsylvania, like me singing these prison songs to praise the gray, to praise her, to tell of me, yes, and of you, my king.
was called Pavan. I was on a bus and I saw a girl. This was in, in um, Japan. And the Jap Japanese like to uh, print arbitrary bits of English on, on sweatshirts or purses and such. Like uh, green vegetables would be a, a motto on a sweatshirt. And some, you, sometimes you see, you see little 12-year-old virgins with, with it, says, it says, do it in the dirt. <laughs> and if you know how proper Japan is, you would understand it's really. But I, this girl was on the, in the back of the bus, and I couldn't really see. But I could see some writing on her red purse, big black letters. Pavan. I thought it said on a girl's red purse, a kind of sad dance, and all day wondered what was being defined. Wisdom, the history of Poland, all the ways of growing old. No, I decided, walking back to the hotel this morning, it must be love, the real love, which follows early delight and ignorance, that a wonderful, sad dance that comes after. I want to read three more poems. Well, I'll read a couple because of the, of just quickly of the, because um, you have some of the mimeograph. This one's called, And She Waiting. Always I had been afraid of this moment, of the return to love with perspective. I see these breasts with the others. I touch this mouth and the others. I command this heart as the others. I know exactly what to say. Innocence has gone out of me. The song, the song suddenly has gone out of me. And I'll read one more of these. And I'll tell you the story. You're not supposed to do this about poems, but I'll tell you the story anyhow. This is long, long before I knew Linda. And I'd gotten, I was involved, I was in love with a, a, an Italian girl, very much involved. And, and a girl came to town, and, and um, we got to know each other. And, and then I said, it can't happen. And so she, she left, and we then I went to Firenze, and I said, it can't happen. And then I went to Rome, and she said, I'm, I'm leaving for America. And it should happen once. So it was one of those typical male things that I wanted to leave an indelible memory. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure all of you have been on one side or the other of this. You want to say goodbye and um, wish them well, but you want something she can't get free of at the same time. <laughs> so I did the whole thing. Uh, you know, marvelous uh, Italian dinner, looking out over the river, and all this marvelous spaghetti and lasagna and stuff, and walk home along the Tiber and back to her place and candlelight. And we go to bed and we start making love. And I start having cramps. <laughs> but you know, I've got to leave an indelible impression. So I just, I just am very cool and, and very gentle and soft. She doesn't know what's happening, I think. And we, we, then I rest a while, and then I start again. And, and this happened two or three times. And finally, my stomach was knotting from all the spaghetti. <laughs> And she finally said, because evidently my, my face was tw contorting and twitching. And she said, what's the matter? So I knew it was too late. So I told her, and she said, OK. And we, and we lay together for the rest of the night. And it was one of the nicest nights I've ever known. And I lay there with her and talking and, and to long after the last bus went. And finally said goodbye and, and got up and walked across the whole of Rome in the dawn and composed the first half of this poem. It's just the most ludicrously sentimental operatic thing in the world, singing it aloud. <laughs> this is from a series of Don, on Don Giovanni, because it's all of the series was trying to understand why Don Giovanni did it. Um, 
Well, you can understand why a really dumb guy spends his life making out with woman after woman after woman. <laughs> you know, or when you're very young. But after a while, if you have talent, or you're like the other gentleman, he's rich, he's able, he, has, he could do lots of things. <laughs> and you keep asking, why did he use his life that way? And the poems were conceived as a series, they're different. The first one on this page called Don Giovanni's Way to Hell Number One is just a, a, a lyric, like an operatic uh, um, solo. This is after, at the end of Don Giovanni, where the commendatore kills him and he goes down into hell. I picture him on this little Italian dirt road, walking toward, you know, uh, purgatory, and kind of singing, you know, what happened and why. And this is one called Don Giovanni and His Way to Hell Number Two. And it's <laughs> And this is for the girl whose name was Sue. I once told Linda, there's nothing between us anymore. You could call her and ask her if you want to. And I came home that afternoon and she was on the phone. <laughs> Don Giovanni on his way to hell, number two, for Sue. How could they think women a recreation? This is Don Giovanni speaking. Or the repetition of bodies of steady interest. Only the ignorant or busy could. That elm of flesh must prove a luxury of primes, be perilous and dear with the rain of an alternate earth, which is not to damn the forested China of touching. I am neither priestly nor tired, and the great knowledge of breasts with their loud nipples congregates in me. The sudden nakedness, the ribs, the mouth, splendid, splendid, splendid like Rome, like loins, a glamour sufficient to m our long, marvellous dying. I say sufficient and speak with earned privilege, for my life has been eaten by that foliate city to ambergris, but not for recreation. I would not have lost so much for recreation, nor for love as the sweet pretend the children's game of deliberate ignorance of each to allow the dreaming. Not for the impersonal belly, nor the heart's drunkenness, have I come this far, stubborn, disastrous way. But for relish of those archipelagos of person, to hold her in hand, closed as any sparrow, and call and call forever till she turned from bird to blowing woods, from wood to jungle, persimmon to light, from light to princess, from princess to woman in all her fresh particularity of difference. Then, oh, through the underwater time of night, indecent and still, to speak to her without habit. This I have done with my life and am content. I wish I could tell you how it is in that world. I'm sorry, I wish I could tell you how it is in that dark, standing in the huge singing and the alien world. Okay, I have to finish and get out of here. Linda and I were, we've known each other about 15 years and we were married for 10. And the first oh, half of it was, was lyric and, and ideal and purely romantic and a kind of chauvinist dream. It was really everything a man could ask, I think. And then when we went to Greece, <clears throat> things had started falling apart. And to me, 
because I think marriage is the, possibly the greatest invention of man, which never works. And what, it, what was important to me to prove it can work, not just the free ride you get at the beginning, but after you get to know each other, after it gets difficult, after all that kind of magic doesn't come so free. And I, I believe that's very intelligent and very mature and very wise, and I was going to make it work. I didn't want to give up Linda. So we worked and worked and worked. And this is one of the scenes. We lived finally on what they think now was Atlantis, a place called Thera. It's an island in the uh, Cyclades, the Greek islands. And it's just a little rim of land that's left because the, the volcano, which it is, it's still a live volcano, but it, it collapsed finally after erupting, 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 it collapsed and fell into the sea. So it's just a little rim of the crater left. And we lived on the unfashionable side. Everybody goes to see the great cliffs and they have their ouzo and buy their whatever they buy and they go away, day trips. But we lived on the other side of the island where no one had ever lived that was not Greek. We lived down by the sea. The purest time of my life. Anyhow, we would walk, I would walk, and usually Linda would come with me across the island, which was four miles, and, and buy the bread or the olives, whatever we're getting, and walk four miles back. But if we stayed in town for any length of time to listen to, we didn't have any phonograph or anything, and there was a man who, a friend of ours who ran the best restaurant on the Great Cliff, what was the interior of the volcano, and he would play tapes of um, bouzouki music all day, except at twilight. Then he would always play Beethoven's Emperor Concerto. And if we stayed for those kind of things, when we came back, it would be dark because there's no lights, no street lights, no automobiles, headlights, no house lights. Dark, really dark. And we'd take, you know, we'd... this is called walking home across the island. It's a big flat island like that. I mean, four miles of what there is. Walking home across the island. Walking home across the plain in the dark, rain, and Linda crying. Again we have come to a place where I rail and she suffers and the moon does not rise. We have only each other. I'm shouting again inside the rain. She's crying to herself like a hurt animal knowing there is no place to turn. It's hard to understand how we could be brought here by love. And the last poem, about, I don't know, uh, eight, nine years ago, I fell 90 feet out of a tree and crushed most of the upper part of my body, crushed my ribs and split my uh, sternum and crush my spine and, and crush my teeth and I was supposed to die. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't die, I was supposed to be paralyzed from the neck down for life. But it was, it was, it happened four days before Christmas and Christmas was uh, very important. Linda's approach to Christmas is you take the mattress off the bed and put it under the Christmas tree so when you wake up, you're looking up into the Christmas tree. <laughs> so I was gonna die at home. <laughs> and I had them build me a skeleton because I couldn't support my own body. There was nothing to support it. I just like that. And so they built me a skeleton, exoskeleton of aluminum and leather. And uh, I remember they had um, uh, uh, lambs, a lamb skin pelt kind of thing and canvas and everything. And I went painfully home. Linda drove me home. And, uh, but I didn't die right away. <laughs> and it went on and on for a few months and uh, after about three months they took the skeleton off they did a lot of tests and x-rays and everything and finally one day they said well there's no reason for you to come back because we've done everything we can do for you it seems you're fine it's miraculous but it's you're fine and I said well I thank you very much and I'm going to go off to Greece with Linda and I started out and I got almost the door and the guy said, oh, one thing, <laughs> you may notice a um, itching or burning sometime at the, at the ends of your fingers. That means the paralysis has begun. 
<laughs> we lived at this place called Monolithos. <coughs> this is after Linda left me, after I came back to San Francisco. And I'm sitting up on, on Petro Hill looking out. It's called All the Way from There to Here. And you have to understand that the best part of my marriage was the four years in which we struggled and suffered and, and worked at it every day against all the odds. That was the part I liked. I mean, that's the part I miss, that marriage. All the way from there to here. This is the last poem. From my hill I look down on the freeway and over to a gull lifting black against the gray ridge. It lifts slowly higher and enters the bright sky. Surely my long, steady dying has brought me to a state of grace. What else can I call this bafflement? From here, I deal with my irrelevance to love and with the bewildering tenderness of which I am composed. The sun goes down and comes up again. The moon comes up and goes down. I live with the morning air and the different airs of night. I begin to grow old. The ships put out and are lost, put out and are lost, leaving me with their haunting awkwardness and the imperfection of birds. While all the time I work to understand this happiness I have come into. What I remember of my nine story fall down through the great pine is the rush of green and the softness of my regret in the ambulance going to my nearby death, looking out at the trees <coughs> leaving me. But I remember of my crushed spine is watching Linda faint again and again sliding down the white X-ray room wall as my sweet body flailed and flailed on the steel table unable to manage the bulk of pain. That, and watching in the years after, for the burning in my fingertips would announce, the doctor said, the beginning of my paralysis. What I remember of that long watching in San Francisco and Greece and Denmark and Greece and London and Greece is Linda cooking lunch. Linda walking with me from Monolithos to Thera daily across the island, of her gold and white coming up out of the blue Aegean. That's what I remember most of death. The beauty of us in that bare Greek Eden as the marriage steadily failed. Thank you. Let's take a 10-minute break and...